you guys all had your midterm. This is what happened. Was it fun? No. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, so we've spent the last, so just a couple uh, announcements. I have problem set nine, the penultimate problem set for you to pick up. Next week I will hand out the ultimate problem set. Um, problem set seven is graded for you to pick up along with solutions. Problem sets one to six you have in principle picked up. If you haven't, I have them right here. Um, okay. So let me just step back a minute um, before beginning our lecture and tell you a little bit about uh, where we've been and uh, where we're going in this class. So, um, so far in this course, we've considered um, special relativity, general relativity, cosmology, all interesting subjects, but all subjects that are really skirting around what I think is the heart of modern physics. Um, the heart of modern physics, of course, being quantum mechanics. So um, quantum physics is a subject um, that uh, you are going to spend um, the rest of your uh, physics career studying uh, in one way or another, most likely. Um, if you're in the honors physics program, you'll take at least three semesters of quantum mechanics. Um, I think it's fair to characterize um, uh, as it's fair to characterize, um, you know, 95% of what physicists do. 90% of what physicists do as touching on some aspect of quantum mechanics. So it's a very important subject. And it's a very difficult subject. That's why you have another three semesters of it coming your way. Um, so what I'm going to be presenting to you over the next two, two weeks or so is really just, I think, a very um, gentle or hopefully gentle introduction to some of the most basic features of quantum mechanics. I'll introduce you to some of the experimental evidence and some of the um, early models of quantum mechanics that were um, discussed uh, in the first few decades of the 20th century um, before concluding with a bit more insight into the basic structure and formalism of quantum mechanics. Um, but by necessity, um, this is not going to be a complete treatment of quantum mechanics. Um, that, of course, would be uh, something that uh, I couldn't do justice to in the next few weeks. So my goal instead is just to present to you a few of the basic concepts and uh, so that you can begin to at least uh, wrap your head around uh, these issues. I should also mention that uh, quantum mechanics is a notoriously confusing subject. Um, there's a uh, famous quote by Feynman which says that uh, if you aren't confused by quantum mechanics, then you haven't understood it. And I think there's really um, a sense in which that is, is true. Um, unlike the other theories of physics, even relativity, um, that as we have seen, quantum mechanics is a theory which requires us to basically uh, reformulate the entire way that we think about uh, observations, the way we think about measurements, the way we think about what it is we as physicists should and should be uh, predicting. We saw a little bit of that in the theory of special relativity. In special relativity, for example, we saw that our notion of causality and of space and time had to be modified somewhat. Um, I think it's fair to say that the modifications of our basic intuitive notions of physics that arise in quantum mechanics are at least as profound, um, and in fact, uh, in some sense, much more profound than that which has to happen uh, in special relativity. So um, by way of uh, introducing quantum mechanics, I would like to begin with um, not any uh, deep uh, discussion of the formalism of quantum mechanics or anything like that, but really with um, a description of a set of experiments that were carried out in the first few decades of the 20th century that really made it clear to physicists at the time just how profoundly uh, weird the universe was when you studied it um, at very small distance scales, and just how profoundly we had to rethink our conception of what matter is and how um, we describe it. So what I'm going to talk about today are a series of experiments that led to the notion of what's called wave particle duality. Okay, or the wave particle nature of matter. So 
Before um, telling you about this wave particle uh, duality, um, let me just remind you of what it is we mean when we say a wave, as opposed to what it is we mean when we say a particle. So when we think about waves, we usually think of light as a wave. Um, and of matter as made up of particles. And the question is, um, what do we mean when we say that? Okay. So when we say that light is a wave, what we mean is that light is described by some propagating solution of the equations of electromagnetism. So it's some sort of electromagnetic wave which exhibits uh, several different characteristic phenomena such as diffraction, interference, both constructive and destructive, and all of the other sorts of phenomena that we see uh, even when you consider, for example, water waves. So um, for example, um, if you consider light as an electromagnetic wave, that means that the electromagnetic field, if you want to describe a light ray <coughs> traveling in the z direction, might take this form that I have written here. So this describes the electric field uh, of a light wave that's moving in the z direction with frequency omega. So omega here is the frequency of the light wave. C here is the speed of light. X hat is the direction of the polarization of the light ray, of the light wave. And um, because of the z sitting here, that means that you're considering an uh, electromagnetic wave that's moving in the z direction. So for example, if you were to take a snapshot at a given time of what this electromagnetic field vector looks like, so at fixed time, you would have some characteristic oscillation like this. And the important feature of electromagnetism, which leads to all of these interesting effects, diffraction, interference, and so forth, is due to what's known as the principle of superposition, namely that if you have E1 and E2 are two light waves, or two electromagnetic waves, then so is their sum. So um, for example, if you consider an electromagnetic wave of the sort that I have written up here, describing an electromagnetic wave with one frequency omega, and then you had another electromagnetic wave with a different frequency omega prime, and you put the two of them together, then you could just go ahead and add those two functions, you know, cosine omega t plus cosine omega prime t, and you would get some new electromagnetic wave. And this leads to all of the usual uh, uh, effects that we associate with um, waves, and in particular, it leads to interference effects. So the characteristic property of a wave is that it exhibits interference. So if we wanted to construct an experiment which would allow us to probe the wave or the particle nature of uh, some object, we could imagine trying to shine a coherent light 
through two slits in a wall. Okay. So this is uh, one of the most famous experiments, uh, I think, in the history of physics. Um, it's been done with a variety of different uh, particles. It's been done with light. It's been done with electrons. It's been done with all sorts of different objects. And um, this is what's known as the double slit experiment. Okay. So what is the idea? The idea is that you have some wall here, which has two holes in it, okay, which are very small. And then you have some source over here. So it could be a flashlight uh, if you're uh, creating uh, electromagnetic waves. Or it could be some radioactive source if you want to create uh, some sort of uh, more interesting particle. And the idea is that we put some screen over here. And you shine the light or the particle or whatever it is from the source. And you look at the image that appears on the screen. And by looking at that image, you can tell whether what you've shown through uh, is a light, is a, a wave, or is a particle. Okay. So, uh, for example, what would happen if we had um, a bunch of particles? Okay. Or what would happen if we had a bunch of, uh, an electromagnetic wave? So let's imagine that we had some electromagnetic wave. Okay, so here I'm just going to draw again that picture of the electromagnetic wave as a function of time. So it's going here towards the wall. And as the electromagnetic wave passes through these two slits, you'll have um, essentially, uh, from the point of view of someone over here by the screen, it will look like light from two sources at the slits uh, with some wavelength. So if lambda is the wavelength of the light, then, of course, that's related to the frequency of the light by our usual uh, friend. Lambda is V over F, where F is the frequency. Or uh, if we talk about the angular frequency uh, instead of the regular frequency, uh, we would have an extra factor of 2 pi there. But the basic idea is that but if you shine light at uh, a wall and you have two slits here uh, in the wall, then it'll look like you have light coming from either slit, uh, the top or the bottom slit in the wall. And because of that, you'll see a uh, diffraction pattern. And it's easy enough to figure out what that diffraction pattern will look like. So to do that, just consider some point on the screen. Okay. And then let's ask how far light would have to travel from these two slits to arrive at that point on the screen. So you could take, say, L1 and L2 to be the lengths that that light has to travel from the two slits. And if the difference in those lengths, L1 minus L2, is an integer multiple of the wavelength, then you will have constructive interference. And so there will be a peak in the diffraction pattern. Whereas if this is a half integer times the wavelength, then you will not see a peak, but rather you will have destructive interference. And so you'll see a trough in the wave function. There's a trough in the diffraction pattern. So if you have light shining on a screen, then what you'll see is some diffraction pattern. I'll just draw over here, which would look something like this. With a successive series of peaks and troughs when the light interferes or uh, interferes constructively or destructively. Okay, so for a wave, 
you have a complicated uh, interference pattern. And that really arises because you have one solution to the equations of electromagnetism that describes a light wave coming out of the top slit and another solution to the equations of electromagnetism describing light coming out of the bottom slit. And the total solution to the equations of electromagnetism is found by adding the two of them together. And that exhibits uh, these interference effects. You would see exactly the same thing, for example, if you were considering water waves. Okay. Um, indeed, if you throw stones on a pond and you throw two of them at the same time into the pond, there'll be some complicated uh, interference pattern coming from the constructive and destructive interference of those waves. For particles, however, there's no interference pattern. So let's say that instead of my uh, flashlight that was sending electromagnetic waves through uh, these two slits to the screen, let's say instead that I had a source of particles. Okay. So let's say that I'm in a batting cage and you've got one of those machines that sends baseballs at you okay, um, for you to hit with the bat. Okay. And then, so if, for particles such as baseballs, or maybe tennis balls, if you like tennis. They also have those machines in tennis. Um, and you have some source of those particles over here. And as you send the particles streaming towards the screen, you won't see a diffraction pattern. Baseballs, uh, at least typically, do not interfere with one another. And instead, you would see just a peak over here for all of the guys that come out of the top slit and another peak over here for all of the particles that come out of the bottom slit. In particular, a particle has the characteristic property that it has a definite location And so it goes through either the top or the bottom slit. Whereas a wave does not have a definite location. We don't say that the electromagnetic wave goes through either the top or the bottom slit. Rather, we say that we have a solution to the wave equation that is a superposition of a wave coming from the top slit and the wave coming from the bottom slit. And so instead of the, and so we have some sort of interference pattern. So this is a clear experiment that we can do. You have uh, two slits and a source, and you shine things through, and you look for the interference pattern. And here's the surprise. This is the surprise that, can hap that happens uh, for in a wide variety of systems uh, when you perform this experiment. So sometimes light behaves like a, part, like a particle. And uh, even more surprising than that, sometimes particles behave like waves. So, um, Let's tackle uh, that second point first, because uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, the truly profoundly surprising uh, experimental result. 
So in particular, uh, in order to describe an object like a, so in particular, uh, the fact which is experimentally true and which really uh, takes uh, some thinking uh, to appreciate fully is that sometimes uh, if you take a set of particles and uh, if you take, for example, a source of electrons and you shine them through a screen, you, what you'll find is an interference pattern of the sort that I have uh, drawn over here. In order to understand that a little more uh, concretely, what we need to do is ask what the wavelength is, what the characteristic wavelength is that would describe the wave nature of uh, some object. So in order to do so, I need to introduce a concept which is known as the de Broglie wavelength. And so um, we've already seen that light, uh, a photon has some momentum. So in particular, uh, if you take a photon with some frequency, then its momentum is Planck's constant times the frequency divided by C, or Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. For an object, With momentum p, we can define what is known as the de Broglie wavelength. Of the object to be given by this same formula, so its lambda is equal to h over p. So this is what's known as the de Broglie wavelength of some object. And the remarkable fact is that under the right circumstances, any object, a normal object, will behave like a wave whose wavelength is given by this formula, h over p. So let me, under, let me describe to you exactly what I mean by that. And so I'm going to describe to you a version of the double slit experiment which was done by Stern and Gerlach. And this is, I think, the most shocking uh, uh, experiment uh, in terms of making the profound implications of quantum mechanics clear. So what they did is they did a version of the double slit experiment where they had an electron source which emitted electrons. And then they observed over here the probability that you would see an electron arriving at a given point on the screen. So if electrons were, so they sent one electron through the screen, and then they waited a little while, and then sent another electron through the screen, and then another electron through the screen, and so on and so forth. And if the electrons went through either the top or the bottom slit, then you would expect that the result would look something like that. But that's not what they observed. In fact, what they observed was an interference pattern with a wavelength that's given by this de Broglie wavelength, h over p. So what does that mean? That means that an electron, when it travels from the source to the screen over here, 
does not go through a particular slit. Instead, in order to describe this consistently, you must describe the electron as a wave. And just as if you sent a water wave through two slits in a wall, the wave doesn't go through either, slit, either one slit or the other, but rather both slits at once. This electron, as you send it through this, uh, this wall with two slits in it, doesn't go through one slit. It goes through both of them simultaneously. And what I'm plotting here is really the probability distribution of events. And what we're seeing here is that as an electron travels from the source to the screen on the other side, there's really some interference going on, just like there was for light. Now, there's an important point that I want to make here which is that you might want to describe this by saying, well, you have a lot of electrons that are being emitted. And I could effectively describe the density of electrons by some wave. And you have each individual electron goes through either the top or the bottom slit. Just like each particle, each molecule of water goes through the bottom slit or the top slit if this were a water wave and that it's really just different electrons that are interfering with each other in some way in order to uh, uh, give you this funny sort of diffraction pattern. But in fact, that's not actually what happens. You can send the electrons through one at a time. You can send one electron through. You can set up the source so you emit a single electron, uh, which will arrive on the other side of the screen. And it'll arrive at a particular location, which you can then measure. And then you can do this again with another electron, and again with another electron, and again with another electron. And if you graph, at the end of the day, the probability that an electron arrives at a given point on the screen, you'll see this probability distribution that I have given here, which is characteristic of a wave rather than a particle. Um, there's a question. Yeah. Is that just with the scanning experiment? Is it strange or not where you have the magnetic field and then the Okay. This is a caricature of the stern gulak experiment. Is this, uh, maybe I got the name wrong. You're right. I thought this was the Young experiment. Is it the Young experiment? Okay, fine. Um, sorry, I got the name wrong. I thought it was the stern gulak the stern gerlach is the neutron one, is that right? Silver atoms, okay, shows you what I know. Yeah, no, the source is, um, okay. I do know what the double slit experiment is. Okay, maybe it's not called stern gerlach What's it called? Is it, is it the Young experiment? Okay, I apologize. What's that? The light one was for sure young. Not Compton. Compton's something else that we'll discuss soon. OK, I apologize if I got it wrong. OK, anyway, this is the experiment, though. Okay. And the remarkable thing is that um, in our current understanding of quantum mechanics, this is not true just for electrons. It's also true for baseballs. If you took your uh, machine, whatever it is in the batting cage, uh, that spits out baseballs once per second, and you shot it and you shone it at a wall with two slits in it, and then you looked at the probability distribution for the baseballs to arrive on the other side of the wall, if you performed this experiment carefully enough and with sufficient accuracy, so you'd have to put it all in a vacuum and you'd have to make sure that nothing else interferes with it, and you would have to run the experiment for a very, very long time. But in our current understanding of quantum mechanics, what happens with electrons is exactly what will happen with baseballs. Okay. In that, literally, the individual path of the baseball will not, not travel through one slit or the other, but rather through both slits simultaneously. 
and will form, the, if you look at the probability of the baseball arriving at any given point on the screen on the right, then you'll see that the probability distribution is not that of a particle, but that of a wave. Okay. Yes, question. Okay, so what you need to do is then you need, to, in order to understand um, how uh, well, uh, in order to understand under what circumstances I could perform that experiment, you would need to calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a baseball. Okay. Your slits would need to be smaller than that. Okay. You'll find on your next problem set when you calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a baseball exactly how small those slits need to be. It's incredibly small. And moreover, you would need to isolate the system from anything else to keep it from mucking up the experiment. So you would need to, uh, you know, and that, of course, is going to be a very, very difficult thing to do, which is why baseballs are typically observed to go through one slit or the other because they're very difficult to isolate in this manner. But in our description of nature, that is really how baseballs behave. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think there's a temptation to view... Um, you know, the first time you see this, there's a temptation to view uh, this as nothing particular fancy. Well, you've seen waves before, waves diffract. Yeah, okay, an electron. I've never seen an electron. So maybe it's a wave, not a particle. Um, but I really want to emphasize to you that this is uh, precisely um, what we think should happen with baseballs, just as it happens with electrons. And people have actually done these sort of double slit experiments, not this one in particular, but experiments of a similar nature where you can view these interference effects with all sorts of objects, um, not, of course, baseballs, but with other particles that are much bigger than electrons, like protons and neutrons that are about 2,000 times bigger, okay? And even, I think, for larger, uh, larger systems as well. Okay. There's a question in back, yeah. Um, well, okay. I'm being, okay, well, you, the, you, of course it would be a very complicated experiment. I'm not uh, going to pretend that I know how to, that I could construct such an experiment. Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, I mean, obviously, if you uh, took a very, very slowly moving baseball, its de Broglie wavelength would be very long. Okay, but then you would have to run this experiment, and then you would not have to localize it too much. You wouldn't have to make the slits too small. But then you would run into other problems, like it would be very, very difficult to isolate the system. Um, or you could try and make the wave baseball very, very fast. Okay. Um, and in fact, um, I'll give you an example of something that's not a baseball, but has about the same momentum as a baseball. Um, and that's one of the protons in the Large Hadron Collider. So they whip these things around the Large Hadron Collider at something very, very close to the speed of light. And I, an order of magnitude estimate for uh, the energy of one of these uh, protons is about the same as the energy of a baseball. And they are, of course, observed to exhibit these uh, sorts of interference effects that I'm describing here. Of course, they don't do double, the double slit experiment, you know, you don't waste a $10 billion accelerator on the double slit experiment, <laughs> but they do more uh, fancy versions of that. Um, yes. Question, there were a lot of questions though. Yes. Yeah. So wavelength is inversely proportional to the Yes. Yes. What's that? Then, yes, so as we will see, there are many different notions of wavelength that we could associate with a baseball. The de Broglie wavelength is one notion of wavelength. Uh, what's called the Compton wavelength is the next notion of wavelength that I'll introduce uh, in a few minutes. Well, I might not have enough time today, but I'll certainly do it next class. Um, and that's an alternate way that we could talk about the wavelength of, uh, of, of an object. And depending on what sort of circumstance you're considering, 
uh, one of them might be the right uh, quantity con to consider. For slowly moving objects, it turns out there's something called the Compton wavelength that's relevant. But for relativistic objects, it's the de Broglie wavelength that's relevant. So for the example of my uh, particles of the LHC, it's the de Broglie wavelength that would be relevant. Yes? Um, so if you ran this sort of experiment with the thing of a vertical size, and you watched one run, what would you see? That's a, OK. That is the question. OK. okay. So the question is, if you ran this experiment, what would you see? with just one object. Okay. And the answer depends on uh, what you mean by what would you see. Okay. Because you can actually do this experiment both with electrons or with photons. Okay. So in the present case, the results that I'm describing here are the results that you would uh, measure if you sent the electrons from the source and then you don't measure anything except the probability that they arrive at a given position on the screen. But you could imagine a second experiment. Um, and in that second experiment, we decide to actually measure which slit we, the electron goes through. So. Electrons are easy enough to measure. They have charge. So let's say that you put a little loop of wire around each one of these slits. Then when the electron passes through, it induces a little current. Um, and so that would allow you to measure um, which, uh, which slit the electron goes through. And indeed, when you do that experiment, you actually find that the electron does go through one slit or the other. So what you find is that you take some electron going through, and then you find exactly what you would have expected if the electron just went through one slit or the other. So you get the answer that you would expect for a particle rather than a wave. So that's why uh, people talk about the wave. People get so confused when they talk about uh, sometimes something's a wave and sometimes something's a particle. Because it really depends on exactly what sort of experiment you're doing. And what we're seeing here is that if you, that the outcome of an experiment will indeed perform, depend on the way that you perform the experiment. So it'll depend on what you choose to measure and how you choose to measure it. So, in quantum mechanics, therefore, it's necessary to develop a formalism to describe exactly how measurements are performed and what is meant uh, when uh, we perform such a measurement. So um, the words that people typically uh, associate with that is something called the collapse of the wave function, okay? um, which is this uh, very uh, kind of mysterious and uh, confusing uh, feature of quantum mechanics, which basically um, tells you that whether something behaves like a particle or a wave depends on uh, at what point you perform a measurement in, during the process of the experiment. Um, OK. I will tell you, not this class, but later on, that I do not believe in the collapse of the wave function. Um, but we don't have to go through that this class, yes. But I can't possibly use the, hate the collapse of the wave function with the white hot passion of a thousand suns. <laughs> um, yes, there was another question though. Well, my question was just, well, isn't the system about Yes. So uh, the standard way that this is said is that we affect the system by observing it. Okay. That's one way of characterizing what's going on here. Um, yes. And indeed, the way that we affect the system by observing it is to uh, make the electron behave like a particle rather than a wave. So that's one way of viewing it. But there's a completely alternative way of viewing it, is that when we interact with the electron, we behave like waves rather than particles. 
but we're not very used to thinking of ourselves as waves. Okay. And so you have to wrap your head around that. But it's precisely that um, reconception of what we mean by observation and measurement that is so confusing about quantum mechanics. Are there any more questions? Okay. We haven't actually gotten very much done this class, I realize, because we started late. Um, but um, rather than try and do Compton scattering in the last one minute remaining to me, maybe I'll just let you guys go, unless there are other questions. No questions. Okay, I'll see you on Friday. Thank <laughs> you.